interest, the monopolists who still own most of Britain. Now, fixing the banks and reforming the tax system are essential parts of the third priority, shifting the economy towards more balanced and healthier patterns of growth. Americans and Britons need to learn to live within their means. A house is a place to live, not a cash machine. Our economy must rely less on housing and finance and invest more in the exporting industries of the future. At the same time, the Germans and the Japanese who have been squirrelling away nuts for a rainy day need to spend more because storms don't come much bigger than this. They need to rely less on exporting and developed sectors that service domestic needs. And all governments need to tackle the obstacles that prevent businesses and people from adjusting. Gummed up labour markets, entrenched producer interests, barriers to innovation and enterprise, misaligned currencies. Open up further to foreign trade, investment and people, encourage clean technologies, help people retrain and find new jobs, and make it safe for emerging economies to tap global capital markets. Now of course it won't be easy. The bubble mentality is hard to break, and so are deeply ingrained savings habits. The dominant financial interests in Britain and America and the export ones in Germany, Japan and Asia are going to fight reform tooth and nail. But if we slip into the, back into the bad old ways, inflate yet another bubble to try to rescue us from the last, it will all end in tears. Now ultimately, a sustainable recovery will come from developing new ideas and businesses that create jobs and enhance productivity. And it will also come from exporting to emerging economies like China, India and Brazil, where there is plenty of pent-up demand. Now, you can, as you can see from the chart, emerging economies, that's the green line, are leading the world out of recession. You see the red line, which is advanced economies, we're just struggling out of it. The green, the green ones are growing at 8% a year, as fast as they were before the crash. And they are the ones who account for nearly all of the growth now in the world economy. Not only that, they are transforming the global economy before our eyes. Now we all know that China is developing fast, but visiting China, re visiting Shanghai really brings it home. The buzz is exhilarating. That maglev train into town accelerates to 431 kilometers an hour in just four minutes. It certainly beats the Stansted Express. <laughs> And then you drive across Luku Bridge and you feel like you're flying, Blade Runner style, through that cityscape with punctuated by massive skyscrapers. And what a crazy skyline it is. Now of course, Shanghai is not representative of China, but neither is London or Britain for that matter. But it's still a window on the future. In the past few years, it spent $45 billion, that's more than the British government's fiscal stimulus to re reinvent itself for the Expo, which has just opened. Two new airport terminals, eight new tube lines, new parks, roads, bridges, a new stadium, and a performing arts centre shaped like a flying saucer. And like the great exhibition in Victorian London in 1851, or the Eiffel Tower erected for the 1889 World's Fair in Paris, the Expo signals that China is now an economic powerhouse. <coughs> And I'm glad to say the British Pavilion looks great. And so does Estonia's. <laughs> but China's, of course, is the biggest. Now, by some measures, emerging economies account for already half of the world economy. And in the years ahead, they're likely to account for the bulk of the world's growth. And that will affect everything from energy use to how the world economy is run. Inextricably, the centre of gravity of the world economy is shifting east and south. Now, of course, it's a tragedy that poverty remains extreme for the bottom billion who live in states that are incapable of providing for their basic needs and cannot tap in to the global economy. They urgently need our help, as I discussed in my first book, Open World. But life is looking up for most of the developing world. In 1990, 63% of people in developing countries lived on less than $2 a day. By 2005, 15 years later, that was down to 47%. And of course, $2 goes much further in rural India than it does in central London. 
1.2 billion more people live on between $2 and $13 a day. Half of the developing world is now middle class. In India, average incomes doubled between 1994 and 2008. And in China, they multiplied by 10, by 10, between 1980 and 2008. And they've doubled since the turn of the century. Now, if you look, these maps show the income distribution in China. The red line is the middle class threshold when you're earning $3,900 adjusted for differences in purchasing power. And you see in 1980, everyone's below that. By 1995, a big chunk is above it. And you see now in 2008, and nearly everyone is above it. Now, three in eight people on the planet live in China and India. And if their living standards continue to rise at 8% a year, they'll double every nine years and quadruple in 18. By 2025, 1.3 billion Chinese, many of whom were starving as recently as the 1970s, could be as prosperous as the Portuguese are today. That's fantastic news. It offers unprecedented opportunities for billions of people to enjoy a better life. It will make the world much fairer and safer. And it can benefit people in rich countries too. New jobs, new businesses, new technologies, a wider choice of cheaper and better imports. Brazil, for instance, could feed the world. India's entrepreneurial companies are snapping up and turning around Western ones, creating new jobs and better products for us. Tetley T, Chorus, that's the old British steel, Land Rover and Jaguar. And in the book, you'll meet Baba Kalyani, an Indian industrialist whose father was a penniless peasant and whose company probably supplied some of the parts in your car. And with China, the world's fastest growing consumer market, any company that taps into it can prosper. In the book, you'll meet Darius Stenberg, a young Swedish guy who is minting it by selling dental alloys to help Chinese people obtain a nicer smile. And you'll see Chinese tourists, they spent $43 billion last year. A few years ago, there were none, now $43 billion. In a few years, they may be as ubiquitous as Japanese ones were in the 1980s. In fact, the, the McKinsey Global Institute reckons that over the next 15 years, Chinese consumers could generate nearly a fifth of global <coughs> consumption growth. And with suitable reforms, up to a quarter of it. And those reforms are things like establishing a proper welfare state, developing service sector businesses that create lots of jobs, and allowing the currency to appreciate, to accommodate and accelerate those changes. So let's face it, China and other emerging economies can help rescue the, rescue the world, help rescue us from this crisis, and eventually they can become the engine of the world economy. Already, China's demand for Im imports is boosting growth across the world, including in Africa, lifting millions out of poverty. Britain's exports to China more than quadrupled in the past decade. So yes, of course, Europeans often worry where tomorrow's jobs will come from. We're all worried that our jobs are going to go to China. But increasingly, in fact, our jobs are going to come from selling to China, India, and other emerging economies. <coughs> 